Carol Adams is here with me to speak about uh, an issue that um, has been coming up a lot. Uh, there's a resurgence of meat pride. As the person who, who has written one of the most uh, famous animal rights books, The Sexual Politics of Meat and The Pornography of Meat, what do you think is behind this recent resurgence in the glamorization of butchers and the romanticization of men that handle meat? What the meat companies have done and what this whole new butchering zeitgeist or, you know, this butchering um, fetishism is to give it is to give a particular reward right. around flesh and around power. The whole thing about the sexual politics of meat is that I was saying meat eating represents power. It represents a patriarchal recapitulation symbolically of power over another. Right. And so what we have now going on with these sort of masculine uh, reinforcement of power and violence as good. It's a cultural phenomenon that is believed to be intrinsic. And therefore, the absence of a dead animal for food threatens something inherent to the individual. And that that threat is part of what causes the resurgence out of that threat is created new mediations on on the same subject. Does that apply also to, you know, sometimes people will say, you know, well, I respect your opinion, but you also respect my opinion. But the problem there is that the, the perspective of the animal is completely left out of the equation. But what butchering has now done is it is saying, I'm going to show you the killing of the animal. Right. I'm going to celebrate that and I'm going to say this is what's honest and this is what's pure and this is what is natural and takes all these sort of buzzwords. Yeah. But the absent referent is still there in its own way. The animal still disappears as a living being. There is also this resurgence of the paleo diet and the caveman diet. And they interpret eating in that way as eating organ meats uh, no grains, vegetables, fruits, right. but um, there's this real machismo associated with it. Why is it that men so much identify with the hunt and with meat eating, and and why is that so? Why do they find so much importance and power in that? Whenever you see nostalgia, that is sexism in hiding. Nostalgia is telling us that people are afraid of change. Yeah. People want to go backwards. They want to go back to what's safe. The safest thing, one of the things people experience for sex role assignments, the need to feel like that is safe and secure becomes, I mean, becomes part of who we think we are. So I see, I would say the paleo diet and the man, the hunter, I mean, that reappeared in the 60s in these popularizations and they were wrong. That's not how civilization evolved. Probably the first dead I, beings that were eaten were insects and what was left from scavenging from carnivorous animals. That is not a heroic male role, but that is what then gets twisted into this idea of the, you know, killing the woolly mammoth. And, uh, you know, in one sense, that's a creation of what's called uh, the subject object relationship. I know who I am by who I've killed or I know who I am by who I control in my life. And that's why the theory evolved in the 70s of woman the gatherer, that women as gatherers had tools that probably were made of wood and would have disappeared, but hunting tools made of some sort of um, more lasting material were found. So it skewed the whole archaeological, anthropological studies. I never heard that. That's really interesting. The problem always will be it is hard to argue with a culture's mythology. Shifting gears a little bit, do you notice a link between um, homophobia and anti-gay sentiment among mainstream men, um, especially for 
um, in relation to not eating meat? The man's supposed to be heterosexual. The man has control over dead animals and over women. Well, then if you're giving up privilege, you must be giving up all privilege. Oh. And it all gets enmeshed again that the what is the negation of the male meat eater? Is the negation of the male meat eater a feminist vegan or a gay male who's vegan? Some of the other people that I've interviewed have been, you know, Germany's strongest man. He, he recently won the strongman competition and he is vegetarian and going vegan. It's interesting to hear from the guys who are in the world of athletics where machismo and masculinity are so narrowly defined, even more so than I think popular culture. It poses these really interesting contradictions. Do you think that that has anything to do with the resurgence in um, romanticizing meat eating at all? One of the things I've seen related to the resurgence or this interest in veganism and masculinity is, you know, the coining of the term hegan. Right. Uh, you know, like, no, we're not wimps. Why within the vegan culture would we want to accept the masculinity definitions and, and all, but the minute we add that twist and a male, we're, we're kowtowing to the sexual politics of meat as we try to resist it. Right. As a gay man who is also vegan, um, there is this pressure to um, have to overcompensate in where the where the stereotypes exist. So people assume that I'm going to be sickly and pale and frail and, you know, all of these sort of stereotypes of veganism. For other guys who um, sort of lean towards these performance sports, uh, these extreme sports, um, there might be an element of trying to prove oneself that, trying to prove that veganism can still um, support that type of activity. I still do not understand why we don't say this is compassionate, that this is how people relate as caring individuals, and that care, caring for others doesn't disable us. You see, that's the, the, the I mean, I think there's almost a disabling um, narrative in all of that, that we're disabled by our veganism. We're weak, we're anemic, we're going to get sick. You know, all of the paleo diet um, uh, testimonies. I was sick as a vegan. I mean, one person on one blog, it's called Carol Adams disease. This is a good segue into my next question, which is how do you define strength? Strength is living with integrity in a world that doesn't want you to live with integrity. The appeal of terms like the protector, the defender, the guardian, um, as opposed to more traditional definitions of masculinity, which are, you know, the pillager, the destroyer, the, you know, the oppressor. Why do we have to redefine masculinity? Why don't we release masculinity? Why don't we just say masculinity, femininity? These are obsolete. This is what we, you know, it's not, it's not whether we bring a diet forward, it's whether we put behind us ways of configuring humans and that are so limited and clearly are untrue. We're constantly told as boys uh, to do things like a man, be a man. Don't be, you know, don't be, the, don't be a pussy, don't be a sissy, be a man. Right. Um, and what do you, what do they mean when they say be a man? Right. Deny every aspect of yourself that feels. I, I really think that we, you, when I've talked to men who went out hunting at 13 and they cried when they killed an animal and they were told to be a man, stuff it down. Do not have access to these feelings. What are those, what is the threat of those feelings that they're afraid of? Well, see, I think that there's a threat that feelings will overwhelm us. That, you know, the minute you start feeling, you have no control. And you're to have control. You are to behave. I mean, it's a terrible thing to impose on people. And to think that, you know, a large, you know, what, 49% of our population is taught this. It's tragic.